My youngest brother used to tell a joke which we thought was very funny when he was about five um, about a guy advertising for a handyman. So another person applies for the job and he says, so uh, can you do carpentry? No. Uh, can you fix plumbing? No. Well, what about electricity? No. But uh, the job is for a handyman. And he said, well, I only live around the corner. So <laughs> <laughs> I only live upstairs in the corridor. So <laughs> um, it's one reason why I'm here. Um, because I, <laughs> because I'm already here. <laughs> but uh, I am grateful. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that many of you are are well on in your studies, um, and therefore well on in your formation. Um, so you probably know quite a bit already about Aquinas, and you know quite a bit already about formation. So I was wondering what's what's the most useful thing to do. Um, and in some ways I'm saying to you, you know, uh, I, I, I'd like to be at your disposal. Um, use me, you know, in whatever way you think is, is best for the weekend. I'd be with you for the weekend with Scott. So, um, so what, I, what I will present this evening is, is something which kind of brings together, if you like, the, uh, the academic study uh, the theology course program that you do, and the thinking about formation, which goes on at the same time, the thinking about formation uh, in general, uh, religious formation and all the other aspects of formation. So, so I'll present that this evening, and and then you know if if see see what you think. Um, my proposal then will be to say something tomorrow morning about uh, about Aquinas's um, anthropology. Uh, his understanding of the human person and how that can can help us in thinking about Dominican formation uh, in general. Uh, and then Sunday morning we'll see, you know, what what's coming out of your own conversation. Whether there are other things that that you'd like to talk about on Sunday morning, uh, we'll see how it develops. Is that okay? Um, so I've prepared a, a few uh, handouts for this evening. Here's the first one. Um, Yes, I have visited uh, visited all the uh, all the, the communities of formation in the four provinces. Um, most recently, uh, San Francisco and and uh, Oakland. Um, here, I was in Cincinnati and Washington a few years back. Um, I don't know whether we we met. I, I gave the retreat in Washington about four years ago now, I think, three, four years ago, so before you came there. Um, and I was in Irving when, when Scott was novice master. Okay, so um, I said let's take the word maturity. Um, you could take the word fulfillment, you could take the word perfection. There are other words that, that we use in thinking about formation. Um, growth in the Christian life, growth in Dominican life. But let's, for, for gas, as we say in Dublin, <laughs> take the word maturity. Um, on the first page of that handout, I picked out the most, what seemed to be the most important references to maturity in the New Testament. The New Testament is the first text of all Christian formation, priestly formation, religious formation. Uh, and there are three that seem to be particularly uh, striking. Ephesians 4.13, which may be the first one that comes to your mind when you think about where would I find the text in the New Testament about maturity. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. It's not a bad place to begin, a Christological point of reference in the first place in thinking about maturity and our own maturity uh, as, as human beings, as Christians and as religious. We must no longer be children. What does it mean to be immature? 
we must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness in deceitful scheming. So we have to have a certain prudence, a certain alertness, a certain shrewdness in, in living our life. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Now, you could spend a long time reflecting on that text alone. You could probably give four or five retreat conferences <laughs> on that text alone. Uh, but it seems to me that that's the, it's certainly the first one that came to my mind was thinking about maturity. Where is it referred to in the New Testament? This to the fullness of the stature of the measure of Christ. This, uh, um, this goal or this orientation uh, when we're thinking about human maturing, human growth, human fulfillment, human perfection, that it's, it's towards Christ. Christ is the is the, the destination and the, the model. There's another one in Colossians 1.28. I'm now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body that is the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. So, a strong Dominican flavour to this text, no? Uh, the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is he whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil and struggle with all the energy that he powerfully inspires within me. So again, there's another very rich text uh, in which the concept of, of maturity appears. And once again, it's in Christ, mature in Christ. So the, con, you know, in confirming that our, our, this is our first reference, this is our first point of reference in thinking about maturity. I like a comment of uh, Thomas Merton Thomas Merton says that um, in the 1940s, I gave all my energy to being the best possible Cistercian that I could be. In the 1950s, I gave all my energy to being the best possible Christian that I could be. In the 1960s, I gave all my energy to being the best possible man that I could be. So it's not a move away from Christ, but it is a, it is a, a deepening um, of, of one's understanding of, of what human maturing or human growth involves, uh, always with reference to Christ uh, in the first place, to be the best possible Dominican, to be the best possible Christian, to be the best possible human being, uh, a kind of a deepening of the understanding of, of what it means to mature in Christ as a human being as a follower of Christ and then in whatever particular vocation we have. The last one I've, I've put on the page is from James chapter 1 verse 4. My brother, the beginning of the letter of James, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete lacking in nothing. So again, another text um, from the New Testament talking about maturity and like the one from Colossians talking too about, about suffering, about endurance, about perseverance uh, in difficulty. Uh, and that's obviously um, always uh, um, an, an unavoidable part of, of maturing, no? of, of growing uh, and of, of um, reaching a deeper wisdom and a deeper understanding of the message of the gospel, the, the experience of, of suffering. Uh, prayer and suffering, it seems to me, are the two ways in which, in which people grow and change. You know? Prayer and suffering are, are, are two tools for, uh, for growth, for, for entering more deeply into the mystery. 
So there are some others there, 1 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, another one, uh, Hebrews. Uh, you can look them up if, if you wish. But the, the one, the three I've, I've put down there seem to me to be uh, the most important ones and the richest ones. So uh, it, it seems to me that that's, that's an important point of departure, you know, not to go straight to a church document or the document of the order, but to, to make this point very clearly that the first text for, for, the, for formation, for thinking about any kind of formation in the Christian life uh, is the Bible, that that's always our, our f fundamental point of reference and, you know, the one from which we should always begin <laughs> and the one to which we should always return. So on the other side of that page, um, I put some references to the same concept uh, in the Constitutions in the book of the constitutions and there are there are five or six places where the word maturity is used in our constitutions the first one is in the fundamental constitution paragraph one of the of the constitutions paragraph six of paragraph one because of the order's mission personal talents and a sense of responsibility are especially esteemed and cultivated by the brothers because of the mission, personal talents, and a sense of responsibility. After the completion of his formation, each brother is treated as an adult. Uh, at the general chapter of Trogir, uh, when was that? Six years ago, there was a petition from one of the novice masters of the order who wasn't quite happy, at least with this English translation. Uh, after the completion of his formation, each brother is treated as an adult. He thought that even during the years of formation, each brother should be treated as an adult. I don't know what you think about that. <laughs> I decided to treat them as adults. Somebody said, oh no, you didn't, did you? Um, <laughs> adults. Um, the, the, the proposal wasn't, wasn't, uh, wasn't accepted and it remains. <laughs> <laughs> It remains as it is there after the completion of his formation. Each brother is treated as an adult. I would think that before the completion of his formation, brothers should be treated as adults as well. No? Competent to teach others and to take on various responsibilities in the order. Many of you I know are already teaching others and, and have taken on responsibilities in the order. For this reason, the order has decided that its rules do not bind under pain of sin so that the brothers may accept them with mature understanding, since you are no longer slaves under the law, but a people living in freedom under grace. The rule of St. Augustine, you know it very well. So uh, here's the first reference to, to maturity in the constitutions, in the very beginning of the constitutions, the fundamental constitution. Um, uh, 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 a statement that, you know, w we want uh, we want the brothers to be mature um, and to understand our, you know, the, our, the legislation we make for ourselves uh, in a mature way, to comprehend it, to see the point of it, to see the sense of it. Uh, they will themselves be involved in the making of it and therefore uh, everybody, oh, we're all involved in the making of legislation for ourselves in chapters as soon as we're as soon as we're participating in chapters no we're we're deciding on the rules of our life together and um, so we, it, the Dominican form of government uh, presupposes uh, men who are free and and mature um, and it doesn't work uh, it doesn't work effectively uh, where people are not free and people are not mature. The next one is in number 27. Um, now this is in the section on the vow of, of chastity and often we'll see in church documents this is where a concern about maturity presents itself. Um, it's not the only area of life in which uh, you know maturity is required. It's required also for obedience uh, very much so. It's required also for the living of poverty. It's required for all other aspects of our lives. But you'll see that 
in church documents, there tends to be, uh, for reasons that we all know very well at the present moment, a particular concern about maturity in a particular area, what people call psychosexual ma maturity or maturity in, in relation to eros, the erotic, the erotic energy which is in us and the living out of our commitments and our relationships in ways that are appropriate to the commitments that we've made. So uh, you'll notice this in other things I will give you that, the, that this concern about maturity uh, and maybe it's a reason why people would prefer to talk about perfection or flourishing or some other term because if maturity becomes too attached to one particular area of life maybe that mightn't be completely satisfactory um, and I want us to keep thinking about it uh, in relation to all areas of our life not just to this one particular area but obviously it's a it's an area which touches touches uh, people very deeply um, the, 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 the reality of, of sexuality and sexual desire and, and eros um, even though it's not the whole of life but it's a central part of life obviously so we have to be thinking about it and um, we have no choice <laughs> but to be thinking about it. So in 27.2 there's another reference to maturity since the observance of perfect continence touches the deepest human instincts and is a requirement in our order for a fruitful apostolic ministry. That's, that's interesting just to note that. Why, why is it a requirement in our order for a fruitful apostolic ministry? And we'll see in some of the church documents this is the, this is the emphasis as well. Maturity in this area is needed for a fruitful apostolic ministry in order to do well the ministry that the church is, 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 is entrusting to us. Um, that's what it's about. So in order to uh, assure, as far as possible, a fruitful apostolic ministry, it's essential that the brothers grow in physical, psychological and moral maturity. Okay. Physical maturity, good health, um, a healthy, healthy living of life in, in all the areas in which it's good to be healthy. Uh, not just physically, physical health, food, rest, sport, recreation, uh, re friendship, relationships, uh, work, um, sleep, all of those things. Uh, psychological and moral maturity as well, so in our, in our, our, our whole person. The next one is, uh, 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 the next two actually are, are uses of the term mature, but they're they're referring to our ministry. They're referring to what we hope will come about as a result of our preaching, namely that people's faith will become more mature. So they're not so much referring to ourselves um, in the first place. Number 110 says the Christian life is affected by change, especially by change brought about by advances in science, the arts or culture. Brothers should do their utmost to discern among those changes the values which lead to a more lively awareness of God. So um, in, in the middle of all that's happening around the place, in culture, in science, in politics, in, in what's going on in the world, uh, what are the values which lead to a more lively awareness of God? Uh, sometimes, you know, we, we lament that people have become indifferent to the message of the gospel. Um, okay, uh, but another question would be to say, what are the things about which people have not become indifferent? What are the things which are exciting people's passion? And I mean their passion for, for what is good and for what is true and for what is beautiful. What are the areas of life in which people are searching for the good, the true, the beautiful, even if, if for the moment they seem to be indifferent to the ways in which those things are present and, and expressed in the life of the church. So. Um, they should endeavour, we should endeavour to answer the questions that this evolution raises in the human mind. So to be engaged with what is going, this is essential work for the preacher to try to be engaged with what is happening in the world, what's going on in people's lives, what are their questions, what are their concerns, uh, to answer the questions that this evolution raises to the end that the preaching of the gospel 
will lead to a purer, more mature grasp of the faith. So it's, it's a way of, of talking about what we hope for, for our preaching, that it will lead people to a purer and more mature grasp of the faith. The French Dominicans have this great phrase, l'intelligence de la foi. You don't have to spend too much time in one of the French provinces before you hear them talking about l'intelligence de la foi. Uh, the, or in other words, uh, an understanding of the faith, that this is a particular concern of, of, of our order, of the, the, the charism of the, of the Dominicans to, to preach um, in a way that addresses intellectual concerns philosophical, intellectual, scientific, um, the questions that, that people will have uh, through their thinking, through their reading, through their, through their competence in other areas of life, to be able to engage uh, at that level in our preaching, um, a purer, more mature grasp of the faith. The same with 124, paragraph 1. The brothers, through their preaching, ought to lead Christians step by step to a mature conscientious faith, thus renewing and confirming the church's witness to the gospel. So the same point in another number. Um, okay, then 155, we return to ourselves, uh, maturity in ourselves. Uh, this is a section which is dealing with formation and says to benefit fully from our formation, the candidate needs the following physical health, Psychological maturity corresponding to his age. Okay. Um, age is not, age doesn't guarantee anything. <laughs> Just because somebody is 20 years older than somebody else doesn't immediately mean that that person is more mature than the, than the younger person. There are other factors that come into play as well. But uh, Obviously, you'd be in discerning among candidates, aspirants and applicants. You'd be looking for a kind of psychological maturity appropriate to, uh, to their age. If they're 20, that's one thing. If they're 35, you would expect something a bit different um, okay, as a starting point. What else? Ability to live with others, a sound Christian life, aptitude, which I think means capacity for study, one of the, the traditional criteria for discerning a vocation. No good health, uh, ability for study and the right intention. These were the three traditional classical criteria for discerning a vocation, good health, ability for study and, and the right intention. So aptitude here is the ability for study. Then the right intention and the free will to give himself to God and the church in the Dominican way of life. Okay, um, so that's, that's maybe obvious, uh, a psychological maturity appropriate to people's age when they, when they come to the order. If somebody's very immature, um, then you might recommend that they, they wait <laughs> um, and live life a bit longer. If somebody seems too mature for their age, that, that's another, <laughs> another concern. I don't know what the solution to that one is, but um, there you go. Uh, 162, I'm not sure if we do this actually. I was looking at this again and saying, each province shall devise programs capable of developing the candidates' human and religious maturity and of preparing them for the apostolate. The programs must be suited to their age and condition programs capable of developing candidates' human and religious maturity and preparing them for the apostolate, suited to their age and condition. So, okay, I, 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 I presume it's part of the, the ratio formationis particularis of each, of each province that there would be these programs uh, included in, um, in, the, in, the, in the general program of formation uh, to help candidates to develop human and religious maturity? That's a key question, really. As, uh, uh, Scott would be aware of it. I was seven years student master in Oxford, and it was a, 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 a question at the top of my mind always about, uh, you know, how, how do we mature? 
as I say, I think we mature through prayer, through suffering, uh, and through the assistance of people who help us to, to find our way through, through prayer and through suffering, through the confusions and difficulties that can come our way. Um, but a formator can't really orchestrate experience for people. You can't say, now, Brother X, I think Brother X needs Y. So I shall go and arrange Y in order that Brother X shall have Y. It's, it's, not, it's not like that. Um, experience, one of my teachers in school years ago used to say, experience is the best school, but the fees are exceedingly high. <laughs> and experience is the best school. And the fees are sometimes exceedingly high. Money, money is the easiest way to pay for something. The other ways in which we pay for things are much more difficult. But, uh, but for me, just can't, we, and we can't even for ourselves, we can't orchestrate experience. Sometimes we have to wait. We have to ask the Lord to, to, to in, his, in his good time, to, uh, to help us with the different things that, that we struggle with in ourselves and in our relating and so on. So, uh, I put there in a kind of a lighter text, uh, just because I came across it under 162, number 163, which is where the, the, the constitutions say why there should be a ratio formationis generalis. That's not an invention of, of fellows in Rome who have nothing better to do. Um, it's actually required by the, by the constitutions uh, there shall be a ratio formationis for the whole order approved by the general chapter or by the master of the order. It was approved by the general chapter of Bologna in 2016 and promulgated by the master of the order on the 22nd of December 2016. So uh, a certain brother in the general council, namely me, was very keen that the new ratio formationis be promulgated in the jubilee year on the 22nd of December. So, uh, so that, that happened. Um, <laughs> these, these are the little things that comfort us in our old age. <laughs> I can look back on my life and say it has all been worthwhile. So, <laughs> um, so what the Ratio Generalis does, it's revised from time to time. 1987 was the last one. 2016, so that's not bad, about 30 years, and uh, that's probably the, uh, the reasonable period of time in which to, to review the Ratio Formationis Generalis as well as the Ratio Studiorum Generalis. It should lay down general spiritual principles, basic training norms for forming the brothers, leaving the provinces to develop their own norms as time and place demand. So that, that work is going on. The, uh, some at the general chapter this year in, in Bien Hoa were shocked that so few provinces had, had already prepared their ratio particularis. We're three years after the, in December, it'll be three years since the ratio generalis was promulgated. Uh, and about a quarter of the provinces have done the work. All of the American provinces have done the work. Um, but other parts of the world have not been so, so, so um, expeditious. Uh, so. Okay, that's just by the by. And finally, <laughs> um, there's another reference, 216. Uh, all, I'm do all I did was go through the Constitution's English translation, find the word maturity or mature, right? <laughs> so um, 216, paragraph 1, and this is a very important one, I think, which is why it's in bold. To facilitate religious formation, those personal aptitudes which contribute greatly towards human maturity should be integrated and developed personal aptitudes which contribute towards human maturity to be integrated and developed. Among them are a stable personality, the ability to make weighty decisions, and the acceptance of personal responsibility. So these are the things that, you know, if you asked our constitutions to, you know, say, say a bit more about psychological maturity, what do you mean by that? Uh, the answer is, is here. This is as near as we get to an answer in the constitutions. Uh, a stable personality, um, the ability to make weighty decisions, and the acceptance of personal responsibility. Okay, anything about that so far? 
I just wanted to clarify when we were talking about uh, being treated as an adult at the completion of formation that that was to initial formation, not on, ongoing formation. Because I guess we're all spiritually children. You know? yeah. No, it's a, it's a really important point. Um, and we're in a moment where the understanding of formation, when we use the word formation, what first comes to mind is, is changing during these years. Uh, and up to a few years ago, it would have been simply initial formation, everybody would have thought. When we talk about formation, we're talking about novitiate and student. Whereas now, not just in the order, but in the church as a whole, uh, there's a much stronger acceptance of the fact that all Christians are in formation always. Religious are in permanent formation, priests are in permanent formation. Yeah, so uh, um, that's, uh, in, in fact, it's one of the, the weaknesses already of our ratio generalis that we talk about permanent formation at the end, which is the old way of doing it. Whereas if you look at more recent documents from the church, uh, the church's ratio of priestly formation, which came out the same month, December 2016, or the documents about the women's monastic life, core orans and so on, uh, when they, their sections on formation now begin with permanent formation and then talk about initial formation. So that will be, that will be the pattern, I think, more and more. Um, so yes, that's a good point. Um, when are we ever mature is another question you could ask. Um, I was chaplain to a girls' school in Trinidad during my pastoral year in the Caribbean. Um, everybody should have a pastoral year <laughs> in the Caribbean. Um, and one of the teachers decided that a good thing to do would be to let the girl, it was a girl's school, let the, each girl put a question in an envelope. A question I have always wanted to ask a priest but was too shy to. So, uh, so I picked out these questions um, on spec. I didn't look at them beforehand, so I didn't know what was, <laughs> what was coming. So, um, so I always remember this question. Uh, can a boy, can a girl of 15 kiss a boy of 16 if they are both mature and they love each other? So I thought, it's a very good question. Um, so I said, now, what do I do here? Um, I said, when are you mature? So that kind of wasn't the, wasn't the response that, I think that wasn't the response <laughs> that the girls were expecting. So um, at least on that occasion, uh, the conclusion we came to, at least I suggested that the best conclusion to come to was, mm, you're mature when you know you're not. And maybe it's dangerous ever to think I'm now mature in whatever area of life. But that, you know, the, the, it's a bit like Socrates, you know, the wise person is the one who knows he doesn't know. The mature person is the person who knows there are still areas where I'm not fully mature. Um, we're, we're always, always growing in different areas. Yeah, so point, point taken, point accepted. Yes. Mm. It does sound strange, you know, when you read it. Maybe it's just the English translation. You know, after formation, brothers should be treated as adults. Whereas some of the brothers in formation are, you know, are coming from very, very experienced backgrounds. And, um, you know, they're already very skilled and they've lived a life before they come to the order. Okay, let's uh, have a second handout for tonight. Um, I'll just pass this around. Don't get a fright when you see the first text. It's just a big block of text, you know. Was it? Has everybody got one? Pastores da Bovobis. Again, I, I imagine this is a document that you've already uh, become familiar with. 
um, an apostolic exhortation no? after a synod of bishops on priestly formation, John Paul II. Uh, so it's a, a point of departure really for thinking about priestly and religious formation in, in the recent history of the church. Uh, and a number of things which were stated very clearly there have, you know, remain points of reference for, for thinking about these questions today. One of them is this, um, this way of speaking about religious priestly and even Christian formation now, uh, which sees four aspects or four dimensions or four levels, whatever, human, spiritual or religious, intellectual uh, and apostolic or pastoral. Um, so that's, uh, that's become a standard way of thinking about, uh, certainly about priestly formation and about religious formation. And famously, Pastores da Bovobis uh, makes this declaration that uh, human formation is, um, did I bring it with me at this point? Uh, no, the, is the basis. The introduction to these two paragraphs, 43, 44, I haven't included the, actually the title of those two paragraphs. It's the section on human formation. And the title of the section is Human Formation, the Basis of All Priestly Formation. So this was a, a kind of a, an interesting point uh, which some people wondered about. Um, now we started this evening by talking about Christ and Christ as our point of reference for all formation. Um, is this making another suggestion that, that we take a different approach uh, and then bring in spiritual or religious, the spiritual or religious dimension? Um, the, the, the process of drafting the working on the Ratio Formationis Generalis took about four years and uh, I mean what we did was um, we worked with the old Ratio to see what, what should stay. Uh, we had a subcommittee of the General Council which worked on what should be added. Uh, I was having meetings with formators, uh, remember in Washington, we had one um, in different parts of the world, South America, Philippines, um, talking with them about, you know, what should be in the, the new ratio, formationis generalis. Uh, and then on the basis of that initial reflection, we did a first very rough draft um, and sent that out to the order um, and gave them six months. To, to look at it and send back feedback and then got a mountain, a big folder in Santa Sabina in the archives of all the feedback we got from, from different parts of the order. And then it was a question of working through that feedback and responding to the concerns that, that the brothers were raising about the text and doing a second text, which is not perfect, but I think is much better than the first draft that we sent around at least that much. Um, so. It's a document written by the order. Um, now you could say a camel, you know, a camel is a horse designed by a committee. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> a Ratio Formationis Generalis is a document written by 5,750 people, you know. Um, so what are you going to get? Uh, uh, but I, th I think something, something good and useful has come through um, in it. One of the most interesting questions for me that came in the feedback was uh, what's, wh what's this distinction? And it's a question not just to us, but to the church, you know. Wh what's this distinction between human and spiritual? If you make a distinction between human formation and religious formation, it's easier to see. You can say, well, religious formation is initiating somebody into the culture of a particular religious order. So you teach them our history, our saints, the way we do things our prayers, uh, our devotions, that's a kind of religious formation, our style in that sense. Uh, spiritual formation and human formation, uh, it's really, I, I thought, well, this is really the question of nature and grace in a way, isn't it? It's another way of putting the question of nature and grace. Um, grace sometimes triumphs over nature, does it? Nature sometimes triumphs over grace, does it? Another. I heard one of the brothers saying this, hearing about uh, 
uh, some situation was a little bit disastrous uh, in, the, in the province. Said. Another triumph of nature over grace. But it's that question. Uh, 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 if I'm maturing uh, in my spiritual life, in my life of faith and prayer, does that automatically mean I'm maturing psychologically or in terms of my capacity to relate to people? Or um, it's, I think that's one of the most important questions. Grace is not magic. Isn't that right? It's not magic. It's not something that replaces nature. Thomas Aquinas, grace does not replace nature. So it's not a gap filler, uh, but brings nature to perfection. And brings to perfection in a spiritual life uh, the nature that each of us has, uh, which, which will include uh, our personal psychological history, no? So the shape of me as a, as a priest, as a Dominican, as a Christian, is, I'm afraid, the shape of me as, as Vivian Boland. This is it. Um, and that will have the, the physiognomy, the face of, of this human being. But that's what's, that's, that's what's called. That's, that's who the, the Lord calls. Not clones of some kind of... <coughs> clones of some kind of uh, perfect model, um, but human beings, and human beings in their human imperfection uh, and sinfulness too. Uh, that so, so it's just, I think at that point, um, there's some interesting, interesting food for thought. Uh, it's easy enough to talk about intellectual formation or academic formation, the studies, the theology, the philosophy. But it's easy enough to talk about um, apostolic formation, pastoral formation, uh, preparation for preaching, uh, in some ways, in, in, in the more concrete, practical ways. But the, I think the really more interesting one, in a, in a, in a sense, <coughs> is uh, human and spiritual formation. Um, so, so that's the one, you know, that's, that's the direction in which I'm moving. We were talking with Scott about this beforehand. We thought this was the, this was the, the emphasis for the weekend, that, that it would be good to, 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 to highlight. Um, but the question came, I think it came from one of the American provinces, I can't remember now who, which brother made this question, but it's always stayed with me as a very good question. Um, why do we make this distinction between human maturity and spiritual maturity. Um, okay, so the first thing on this is uh, pastores d'abo vobis, uh, these big paragraphs. I won't read all the way through the paragraphs, but just pick out the main points. Um, in 43, the priest is called to be a living image of Jesus Christ, to reflect as far as possible the human perfection which shines forth in Christ, in the incarnate Son of God. Uh, the human formation of the priest shows its special importance when related to the receivers of the mission. And th this is a point to be stressed. Uh, why do we want priests to be uh, mature, humanly? Because they're going to be let out <laughs> on the people. And we want them to be relating well to the people and we want the people to be able to relate well to them. So that's, that is not me, this is John Paul II. No? Um, it's special importance, this human formation, when related to the receivers of the mission, that the ministry be credible and acceptable, that the priest mould his human personality in such a way that it becomes a bridge and not an obstacle for others in their meeting with Jesus Christ, the Redeemer of humanity. So. Here's the instrument the Lord has chosen. There are certain aspects of my personality, my way of saying things, my sense of humor, my interests that will work with some people and might not work so well with other people or cause misunderstanding, as has happened from time to time, with, with, with other people. So as far as possible, we try to ensure that this human instrument is, as far as possible, a bridge and not an obstacle for people, not in their access to me, but in their access to Christ, because that's my job, is to 
to preach the word of God, to, to, to facilitate the encounter between the word of God and a human being, another human being. So uh, if I can help with that, very good. Uh, if I'm an obstacle in that, well, that's not very good. Future priests should therefore cultivate a series of human qualities um, with a view to the ministry to be balanced people, strong and free, capable of bearing the weight of pastoral responsibilities. So then it gives a kind of a list of virtues of the priest, if you like. Uh, they need to be educated to love the truth, to be loyal, to respect every person, to have a sense of justice, to be true to their word, to be genuinely compassionate, to be men of integrity, to be balanced in judgment and behavior. So if you like, that's a, a kind of a little litany of the, the virtues of the good priest. Um, when I was a novice, we still had reading in the refectory. And I remember we were reading a book by a priest called Leo Trese. I don't know if you ever heard that name, T-R-E-S-E. -E. I think it was an American, Leo Trese, on the priesthood. And I always remember, you know, the, um, uh, one, fra one sentence from that book uh, where he said, the only epitaph a priest should really want on his tombstone uh, is he was kind. So just stay with me as a, you know, if you want to be remembered for anything as a priest, he was kind or compassionate. Um, of special importance, the capacity to relate to others. Okay fundamental for someone called to be responsible for a community, to be a man of communion. So here's the other side, not to be arrogant or quarrelsome, but affable, hospitable, sincere, prudent, discreet, generous, ready to serve, capable of opening himself to clear and brotherly relationships and encouraging the same to others, quick to understand, forgive and console from Paul's pastoral epistles. So nothing un you, nothing original in that um, so in that paragraph you have a, a two lists uh, of of priestly virtues uh, as a human being how should this man be uh, here's here's a, a, an answer at the end then it makes a link with the following paragraph in this context affective maturity which is the result of an education in true and responsible love is a significant and decisive factor in the formation of candidates for the priesthood. Now, uh, affective maturity is a way of referring to sex, celibacy, chastity, uh, emotional entanglements, uh, the emotional and, and physical, emotional physical aspects of relating to other people. Uh, in Europe, they, they tended to use this phrase, la vie affective, which is the affective life, which is, you know, the life of, of feeling, of passion, of uh, especially uh, of, of our interest in other people, perhaps sometimes our sexual interest in other people, uh, but to say it in a way that's a little bit more delicate, coming from the Holy See. So we talk about mm -hmm. la vie affective, the affective life. So. Um, Affective maturity. Okay, so, crikey. Um, <laughs> paragraph 44, then, is about that. This is the second paragraph, which deals with um, human formation in pastores da bovobis. The, the, the text is much bigger than what I've given you here. If you go and look at these paragraphs, you'll find that they're much longer. But I've tried to just pick out... Um, pick a, it's, a, it's another document edited by a, a committee. So it's you know, much longer than necessary. But um, 44, affective maturity presupposes an awareness that love has a central role in human life. We're speaking of a love that involves the entire person in all his or her aspects, physical, psychic, and spiritual. So I want to love Christ. I want to love Christ's people. The, 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 the resources I have with which to love uh, are, are physical, psychological, spiritual. The desire of love in me uh, is a desire which is about uh, union, 
uh, with another person, with other persons, communion, and uh, and a, the generation of life. These are these are fundamental desires in in the human animal, no, in the human being, uh, communion and life giving. Uh, so any any human being who wants to follow a way of 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 life. Uh, that's to be mature and true and, and authentic. Uh, that way of life has to have these aspects to it. It has to be a way of life which gives you uh, the possibility of loving with all the energy <laughs> that a human being has for loving. Uh, in other words, there has to be some aspect of communion, union with other people and giving of life in order to uh, to engage those energies in us, those, those resources that are there in our nature. Now, John Paul II, so you won't be surprised to see the way in which he talks now, which is expressed in the nuptial meaning of the human body, thanks to which a person gives oneself to another and takes the other to oneself, a central concept in John Paul II's theology of the body, no? the nuptial meaning of the human body. Um, there it is. Since the charism of celibacy, even when it's genuine and has proved itself, leaves one's affections and instinctive impulses intact. We don't stop being men when we make a vow of chastity. Obviously not. Our affections and instinctive impulses remain intact. So candidates for the priesthood need an affect of maturity, which is prudent, able to renounce anything that's a threat to it, vigilant over body and spirit, capable of esteem and respect in interpersonal relationships between men and women. A precious help can be given by a suitable education to true friendship, following the image of the bonds of fraternal affection which Christ himself lived on earth. Human maturity, and in particular affective maturity, requires a clear and strong training in freedom, intimately connected with formation to responsible freedom is education of the moral conscience. So this is a, th these texts are, are quite old, before some of you were born, but uh, I think they're still worth, they're still worth looking at from time to time. It still seems to me to be a, a fine statement of what, you know, what the church has been meaning when it has picked out human formation for special consideration. Then, 45 is the beginning of a new section. Human formation, when it's carried out in the context of an anthropology which is open to the full truth regarding the human person, leads to and finds its completion in spiritual formation. So uh, it's, 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 it fits neatly, I suppose, with, with a Thomistic approach to things, that there is a, 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 a natural level which has its own coherence, integrity, significance, meaning, uh, which leads us towards, which brings us to, which opens, opens a way towards a fulfillment uh, in the spiritual or theological uh, level. Um, and that's what I would want to talk about tomorrow then, to say, OK, well, we know an anthropology which is open to the full truth, truth regarding the human person. Uh, we like to think, don't we? We would, wouldn't we? that Thomas Aquinas is someone who proposes an anthropology which is open to the full truth of the human person. So hey, maybe we can you know, look at him again and see what are, the, what are the aspects of his thought that would help us to enrich uh, for ourselves this, this understanding of, of the different dimensions of, of a human, human formation, spiritual formation, uh, uh, as religious and as priests. So uh, the other side of that page is not as long, and we can finish with this tonight. It's just in the Ratio Formationis Generalis. Uh, what is there there about um, maturity? And there's, uh, there are two sections in particular. Um, in, in, the, in part one, there's a section B, which is called the process of integration into Dominican life. And there's a part C, which is called contexts of formation. Um, yeah, these are things that, you know, as, as, as you, if you have the privilege of making a pilgrimage around the order, as members of the General Council have this privilege of making these pilgrimage around the order, 
uh, you learn a lot, obviously, you learn a lot and you see a lot, and you understand that there are many different situations and circumstances, and that the order is, is alive and well in over 110 countries or something like that, um, in very different ecclesial, social, political, cultural situations. So a document which is addressed uh, to the whole order uh, has to acknowledge this reality. There are still provinces where young men begin their formation at the age of 17, for example. There are some provinces where what the order has to offer young men in the first place is their high school education. There are other provinces who wouldn't dream of accepting anybody who hasn't already finished college. So uh, you need to say something to to both of these situations. Uh, that's, just, uh, that's just one kind of difference. Uh, so these two sections of the Ratio Formationis Generalis, part 1b and part 1c, are trying, are, are, are in order to take account as far as possible of, of these kinds of differences. Uh, differences in the age at which people are being formed, uh, differences in the educational background with which people come, uh, differences in the cultural and social settings in which the order is, is preaching the gospel and so on. The paragraph I put uh, in full is paragraph 34, um, which is the beginning of section part 1, section B, the process of integration into Dominican life. All aspects of formation require time. That, that sounds banal, but um, it would be interesting just to think, you know, what, what, what is young people's experience of time today? Um, especially in developed parts of the world where <coughs> things happen like that. Uh, then they come to a religious tradition in which uh, time is, is, is indispensable for entering into some of the ways of this, of this religious tradition. And it's not something that you can, you can do like that. Um, so it may be not as banal a, 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 a starting point as it might seem at first. All formation requires time. LCO describes the kind of maturity we need. We've already seen that. Such maturity is seen in a stable personality. We've already seen that. It means, what does it mean, this maturity? A good sense of personal autonomy combined with a sense of the other person and the interests of the community. So the capacity not just to relate to myself, <laughs> but to relate to another and to relate to others. Um, these are two different kinds of challenge. Uh, to be able to relate to another is one thing. To be able to relate in a group to a group is another thing. Um, it requires the ability to find balance in a lifestyle that makes varied demands. You know that almost immediately, at least as soon as you leave the novitiate, you begin to realize that this is a lifestyle which makes, makes varied demands, which, which, you know, in which the need to find the balance is a, is a permanent part of the, of the, of the task uh, between the different elements. If I'm to be faithful to all elements of the Dominican life as they're outlined in the fundamental constitution, uh, I have to be, I have to be thinking about that more or less all the time. Um, freedom from addictive and compulsive behaviour. Um, again, if we bring in the point from from Pastores da Bovobis, that freedom from addictive and compulsive behaviour is not just for the sake of my own personal health, physical and psychological. It is for that, but it's also in order to be. Uh, at, at the service of the ministry I've received in order to be a good instrument of that ministry because inevitably addictive and compulsive behaviours will find their way into I can't keep them in my room uh, they will find their way into how I how I relate to people or how I how I get preoccupied about things how I react and respond to things and so on the ability to live with tensions and to deal with conflicts, it's another aspect of time, no, just to say, okay, uh, give it time, uh, hold it, hold it for the moment. Um, obviously, you know, it, 
we don't want tensions to stay around for too long uh, but sometimes we need to to allow allow the um, what would you say the just as we ne the body needs time to heal from physical wounds uh, the soul the spirit uh, the heart needs time to heal from from psychic psychological wounds um, so we might have to hold attention for time to deal with conflicts to be at ease with people no matter what their race age gender or social position doesn't mean that everybody is immediately at ease with everything I can imagine being with you know some people with certain difficulties or problems and initially uh, I mean the, the whole trans world that's emerging in recent years I I, I don't know how how I would relate to somebody if somebody came to me and said I've been a I've been a man and, and I think I should become a woman or I've been a woman and I think I should become a man I'm just taking one example of something that I think would would throw me and I, I'd say I, I don't immediately feel you know uh, at ease with that being presented with such a situation does it mean I'm not mature well okay it might mean I'm not mature but that's the fact that's the reality um, so th uh, there will and there will be other things that might you know make up you might have other situations or kinds of people that would that would leave you uh, uneasy um, so we're not saying you know you have to be immediately at ease with every possible situation and circumstance and person but to think about it at least to be aware of it and to say what you know what do I do to, to, to be the, the bridge between this person and, and Christ? Um, formation seeks to help brothers to mature in all these ways. Okay, the work of Thomas Aquinas on human action, passions and virtues offers a solid starting point for reflecting on psychological maturity and moral development. His work ought to give shape to our formation in conversation with the best of contemporary thought and experience in these areas so that's the point I wanted to reach this evening to say okay so maybe tomorrow we'll have a look at Thomas Aquinas an anthropology of a particular kind and say you know are there ways in which this uh, this will be helpful to us um, in thinking about human and spiritual formation that's that's the focus okay so far, so good, I suppose, so far. Any comments or questions? I, um, so I'm, we talked about in paragraph 44 of Pastoris Dabo Vobis. Um, so I, I imagine probably all of our experiences of formation have had some emphasis on the importance of friendship, yeah. but this line struck me and I was wondering if you could shed light on, like how is one, how do you, how do you, how are you educated for friendship? Um, I mean, it just seemed like a very curious turn of phrase, but possibly very interesting. Education. Yes, it, I, I mean, it's, uh, it's the, another way of putting the question I put earlier when I was student master saying this person would benefit from an experience of friendship. Can I organize a student master? Can I organize, you know, be a kind of introduction agency? and and help a person to it, it, you can't really you can't um on one level you can't organize experience for people you can stay with people and and think with them about their experiences of of friendship or things that go wrong in friendship or the loneliness that there can be when you're in a group or um feeling that you know your others are accepted and you're not and are you know, so the, the formators can, can do work with people on these, on these questions. Um, I suppose education in friendship is, is also probably saying, well, um, you know, if my very good friend is a, is a Dominican sister who has the same vocation as myself, but is actually a rather attractive woman as well, um, then I need to be educated in, in it's in how to how to manage this friendship um, so that it stays you know within the within the parameters that we would both want it to, to, to have so um, 
So then your education is coming from where? Well, it's coming from maybe reading about examples of friendship or seeing other people and their experiences of friendship. Um, you know, and I remember realizing early on that, that you know the brothers that I thought were more balanced and, and um, effective in their preaching, I discovered were, were, were also the brothers who, who had good experiences of friendship, uh, so that when they spoke about the friendship of God or the friendship of Christ, they, they were speaking out of a, a real human experience of, of that reality. Um, so, so education in true friendship would be help with, with um, help with with the situation when when a person seems not to be finding friends. Help with the situation where a person is finding friends, <laughs> and and you know um, needs to, to 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 balance the friendship because um, we all know you know in groups what can happen if a friendship is too exclusive. Uh, the 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 you know there can be impacts it can impact on the dynamic of the whole group. Uh, sometimes it's I mean it's very good. all French as one of my wiser older brothers used to say, they used to warn us about particular friendships, but all friendships are particular. So you can't have a general friendship. Uh, <laughs> I'm generally friends with all of you. Um, all friendships are particular. So um, all friendships are particular. And it's very good for everybody to have friends. You know, um, so the Bible speaks about it many times, about the, 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 the great treasure that it is. But then friendships can become, um, you know, a, a egoism I do, you know, a, a double egoism if, 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 uh, if we get so happy with each other that, that the friendship uh, doesn't have the, a kind of life-giving aspect for the for the whole group then it's uh, it's a problematic or it could be problematic anybody else is it okay what's what's what i propose yeah so um and yes it's a bit experimental uh, in the sense that you know i'd like i'd like you to to contribute as well um tomorrow and then we'll see for sunday what i've no particular plan for sunday morning um and see what emerges Tomorrow, tomorrow morning. Thank you, okay, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah.